everybody it's captain kyle i'm here with wilson cruz a very talented actor who will be appearing at far point 30 in hunt valley maryland on february 10th through the 12th and he is known for his roles on my so-called life 13 reasons why party of five coffee day and of course dr hugh culber on star trek discovery <laughs> how are you doing today wilson i'm really well thank you thanks for having me oh thanks for taking the time so let's get right into it. So prior to Star Trek Discovery, you didn't have a ton of roles in sci-fi projects, but there was one in particular, Supernova. <laughs> <laughs> what was your experience on that movie? Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm sorry you died, by the way. I just watched it recently. <laughs> um, I, die, I die in everything, as you probably know by now. I've, I've, I've died in almost everything I've ever done. Um, my experience on that was... I mean, it was, it was, it was an experience and here's what I'll say. So I was doing rent on Broadway. So I took six months off. They allowed, they gave me a six month break. I could go do the movie and then I, they, they tacked the six months onto the end of my contract. So they just extended me. So anyway, I left New York. I flew to California. Um, our director, Walter Hill, um, wanted to be home every night to have dinner with his daughters. So we were done <laughs> at 6 p.m. every day. So nice. I we worked from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And it was summertime in Los Angeles. I was in my 20s. It was like it was and it was the first, it was my first studio film. So I became friends with Angela Bassett who, oh, you know, wow. was a, became a bit of a mentor to me at that time. Um, I will tell you this, and I don't think I'm telling anybody anything that will get them in trouble, but I was offered this part because Vincent D'Onofrio dropped out of the movie. And because, you know, I'm the second person you think of after Vincent D'Onofrio. <laughs> you think, oh, well, we'll get Wilson Cruz. Um so I, they sent me the script. I read it. It looked like a fun thing to do. I was excited about it. The thing is, every single day we showed up to set, there were brand new pages sitting in your dressing room. So pretty quickly, I realized there was no use in me memorizing any of my lines because they were going to be completely different lines by the time I got to work the next day anyway. So it became the most educational improvisational film work i have ever done because it, there was no halfway through the filming of the movie i didn't know what the story of the movie was because it kept changing so you had to trust when you when they said action you had to work in that moment you couldn't rely on what happened before or what's happening next, because there was no guarantee that it was going to be what you thought it was going to be, because you would show up to shoot the scene and it'd be different. So it was a a, a project of trust. <laughs> I just kind of threw myself into it. And it did teach me to leave my work on the stage and then go home and have a life, right? Because I I couldn't I couldn't use my evenings to prepare because it was going to be different the next day anyway. So it did teach me some work ethic, right, about how to take care of myself, but also how to um, how to be in the moment and trust your director and the producers and and trust that they knew what they were doing. I'll tell you when I went to the premiere of the movie and they played it, I was like, Oh, that's, that's the story <laughs> we were <laughs> we were telling. Cause I couldn't tell you what it was while we were making it. <laughs> that was my experience. Wow. Well, I mean, trusting the director and is on every film because you don't know how it's going to end up, what's going to be cut out what the editors are going to do because you could have the best scene and a bad editor could make it horrible. And I was or... in my, and I was in my mid twenties. It was my first studio film. Nobody was going to listen to anything I was saying, right? Like I had no, I, I had no uh, reason to believe that my opinion was going to matter one way or the other. I was the new kid. So I was learning the ropes and boy, did I learn them. <laughs> Absolutely. And you mentioned Angela Bassett. I oh, my mean, God, who I love. 
wor- working yeah. with my two yeah. queens. <laughs> my two queens won Golden Globes last week. Angela Bassett and Michelle Yeoh on the same night. How cool was that? That is awesome. <laughs> Talk about lessons in resilience, you know, models of resilience. Those two women are absolutely that for me. I was actually amazed at the all-star cast. I mean, it's not exactly a classic in science fiction, no. but you no. have James Spader, mm-hmm. um, Peter Facinelli, um, Robin, Robin Tunney, Robert Lou Forster, Diamond Phillips. Yeah. Lou Diamond Phillips, Lou Diamond Phillips, who... He and I spent most of our time on set just um, challenging each other to sing one musical theater song after another. Because <laughs> he had just finished doing The King and I on Broadway, and I was obviously taking a break off of Rent. So we helped, we kept each other entertained with our musical theater knowledge. Was it a contest? Did someone win? <laughs> yes, I win every time. <laughs> okay. I, I believe you. <laughs> So I'm sure you've been asked this more than a few times. So prior to Star Trek Discovery, did you watch the show? Were you a big fan? And yes, what's your favorite? I was, <laughs> I was, you know, I was the target audience age-wise for Star Trek Next Gen. So, you know, those people were part of my childhood, right? Like, you know, Beverly Crusher it was my doctor, uh, my North Star, the person who... Um, modeled uh, uh, leadership and um, gravitas was Picard, Patrick Stewart. So when I met Patrick Stewart for the first time, I had to be sedated. Um, (laughs) You know, yes, they were very, and LeVar Burton, you know, the fact that I'm friends with LeVar Burton now, it blows my mind every time. I I just, I love that man so much. I have such respect for him. so yes, I was the Star Trek was a huge part of my life uh, as a teenager, and so when I found out that they were making a new Star Trek series, I did go out of my way to reach out to Brian Fuller, uh, who I had done, uh, who I had worked with on Pushing Daisies. Mm-hmm. Um, I was on the series finale, and so I I just put a little bug in his ear when I found out. I was like, hey, just so you know, I'm a Trekkie and. I would be really open to being a part of this new project. And so I planted the seed and here I am. Well, we are glad that you planted the seed in it for fruit. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so on Discovery, there's a ton of CGI effects, obviously. Have you ever found that your reaction to them was not quite in proportion to, to what actually you saw later on or what you were supposed to be seeing? Do they tell you like what, what it's supposed to be? <laughs> My one of my favorite stories is the very first season. It's actually I think it was the the my the second episode. No, the third episode I shot, which was episode. F- no, it was actually the first episode I shot. So it was episode four. I believe it was Lee Rose. I think that was the episode Lee, Lee Rose was directing. It was either four or five. Sorry, but um. It's the it's the episode where we're dealing with the tardigrade and Sonequa and I are supposed to be standing in front of the tardigrade talking about it. And I ask Lee, you know, because it's supposed to come out of nowhere and kind of scare us and we're supposed to see it. <laughs> she says, so it comes out of the dark. It's about this big. And, you know, it's it's an imposing figure. Um, you you should you should show some fear. And so she goes back to her seat, video village. She says action and I react <laughs> and she, you hear, you hear cut, cut. That's too big. It's, it's not, it's, it's not attacking you. It can't, it can't, it can't come and get you, but you know, smaller reaction. She goes back to her seat. She yells action again. And I go, huh? she goes, no, you know what? I don't even want you to see it. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much. But that was before, you know, that that was the early seasons. That was before we had our, um, why am I having a brain fart? Before we had the the the, the 260 screen, the, the LED screen. Right. That we use now. Um, the AR wall, that's the word. That's what I was looking for. Um, but which has completely changed the game, right? Because you don't, we don't have to imagine much anymore. 
right? I mean, everything is there. Um, I'm thinking of like the at the season, the end of season four, when we're on that alien planet. I really felt like we were on that alien planet because it, it we're surrounded from ceiling to floor in 260 degrees. You can really suspend disbelief in that in 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 real ways. Um, so, you know, there's no acting with golf, with a tennis ball or imagining that a piece of tape is somebody else. It's it's all kind of created for you. And as an actor, it's just 85 percent easier to do um, now. You can really let your imagination roll with it. I will say this. Sometimes there's a little bit too much freedom. Right. Like sometimes you want some parameters, but like. You know, we have all of these special effects um, that we pull up that, for instance, you know, um, a lot of my 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 um, medical tools are no longer actual things that I hold. They're they're created by the site, by the by the special effects team. So I'm always like, well, how does this how does this work? You know, do I where is the knob? And they're like. You just wherever you want to put it, that's where it'll be. And I'm like, you gotta, you gotta give me some parameters to like work with. And they're like, honestly, whatever you do, just don't do it too fast. We'll make it work. And I just got to the point where I was like, nope, I just want you to tell me, is it a switch? Is it a dial? <laughs> you know, something. I, I need you to help me make some decisions here because too much freedom sometimes is too much. Plus, you want it to be consistent. If you're going to use the same tool right. later on, you don't want to be Thank twisting you. it when last time you flicked it, you know? So, see what I'm saying? This I definitely. Saying. So, do you ever have a hard time remembering all the techno babble? <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. I, um, I'm not as bad as some. I'm not going to name names. Um, <laughs> but I, I am not as good as, as Anthony Rapp. Like, Anthony Rapp. And Blue Del Barrio are the the masters of the sci-fi jargon. I am not so great with it. I have to go home and thank God, thank God that the writers actually um, base a lot of the jargon on actual science. So if I go home and I study and I have like a speech with a lot of uh, jar science jargon in it, I will look up a lot of these words. And it'll help me understand what I'm saying. Um, sometimes the science is extrapolated, you know, to the century that we're, we're in, to the 32nd century. But if you look up the words and get a bit of the meaning, it makes it easier for me to, to memorize. But, I, I, you know, I've gotten better through the years. But season one and two, that was tough. I'm not going to lie. That was tough. Well, you need to get the thingamabob out of your whatchamacallit. And, uh... I mean... <laughs> And thank God, then they made me the counselor. So, you know, I could deal with feelings that, that I could do. I can understand that. So you're a little bit of Troy. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I I'm, have I'm to crusher meets Troy. <laughs> I have to compliment you. And of course, you know, the writers and Anthony Rapp in regard to how your relationship is portrayed on the show. It's, you know, it's had its ups and downs. You kind of died. You know, so yeah. <laughs> till death do us part. I don't know how that works. Did you get remarried? <laughs> right. Do those <laughs> do those elements of that on screen relationship affect your expectations regarding like real life relationships? As that mm. like mm. interesting. Um you know, I, I hope that if and when I ever am in another relationship, that it is the kind of relationship that Stamets and Colbert have created, which is ride or die, right? Like these two people truly trust each other. They've been through so much together that they've earned each other's trust. You know, I think that they are also two people who are in awe of each other's genius, right? Who appreciate that this person isn't me, but I identify the genius in them and appreciate them for that. Um, and I want to make help make them live up to their potential. I feel like that's what that that relationship is. They're very different. They kind of complete each other. They're yin and yang. 
but they need each other in order to function. And so I hope, you know, if I'm lucky enough to be in another, in another relationship someday, that, that that's the kind of dynamic we have. Um, I will say that the relationship that Stamets and Culber have is based on a real respect that Anthony and I have for each other. We never sat down and, you know, created a, um, a backstory. We just took our real love for each other since we've known each other for 26 years now um, as friends and just created a relationship for this couple out of that. Um, and it seemed to work. Oh, it definitely does. I'm a, I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> Though it will be interesting if you get into a future relationship to be like, well, you're not like my on-screen partner, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I could see myself saying that. Paul would never say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not in the 32nd century. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I, I need to mention that Yali, our um, content manager, loved you in Coffee Date. She's like, she she totally loves you in there. And she wanted me to pass on her thanks for representing the Hispanic community um, with your work. I'm proud um, to do it. Do you feel that that's another part of your professional career is kind of representing, you know, the the gay community and the Hispanic community? Is that like adding a little pressure to you? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I would, I, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I early, especially early on in, when I was younger, that I, that I felt that I didn't feel pressure. I, I felt some responsibility. I think that's a better way of putting it. I, I, I felt, especially for my so-called life, um, you know, I was the first openly gay man to play an openly gay role on network TV here in the States. I was also only one of two Latinos on network television in 1994. It was me and Jimmy Smits, and we happened to be on the same network. Um, and so when you do press, especially back then, you, you were asked to speak to entire communities. And I was 19, 20 years old. I was barely, you know, I barely knew who I was. But um, I did know that in taking on that role that it came with responsibility and that I would have to come out to my parents because I knew I was going to speak to the issue at the time. It was 19, it was the 1990s. We were, um, you know, part of uh, uh, one of the most powerful things we could do politically at that time was to be visible and vocal. Um, and I had a platform and I felt a responsibility to people who look like me, to people who love like me, to speak to that experience um, at a time when the country seems to be having a debate um, <laughs> in, a, in, in a very vocal way. Um, and at a time when we were losing thousands of young men to an epidemic. Um, yeah. And so, yes, I felt some responsibility to that. Nowadays, I feel like there's there's so much there's a there's an army of of young actors and people who are capable and willing to speak to it. And my job is to make it easier for them to be able to speak. So when I look at Blue Del Barrio um, or Ian Alexander, like how am I making their work experience on set on this show um, one that allows them to be their to, to live up to their potential and and be do their best work and to give them permission to speak to their own experience. Right. So, you know, I, I feel like I, I'm now that I'm almost 50, that I can play more of a mentoring role for these young actors and clear a, 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 a better path for them than I had. And I enjoy doing that. I feel like that's 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 appropriate. Absolutely, though. It's at least now you can share the responsibility as more. There are more yes. represent, representation in uh, Hollywood, but obviously, and I, I've I've read about you know you went through some personal, I would say hardships, and that might be too too much too little of a word, you know, coming out to your family and everything. But professionally, did you find that having come out? Did that make things harder professionally in some cases? And has that gotten any better? 
Um, it's definitely gotten better. Um, well, I mean, you know, there's there's two things at play here. One, um, there wasn't a lot of material for me, you know, um, as an openly gay man of color in the 90s and the early 2000s. So I had to um, blaze my own trail, if you will. Um, I had, you know, most of my job was convincing creative people that the character that they had created in their minds didn't necessarily have to look the way that they had imagined them. Mm -hmm. I had to give them permission to think outside of their own box. And that can be tricky, right? Because creative people can be stubborn and they also have a vision for themselves. I get that. And I don't deny them um, the need to create the story that they see in their minds. But there is a way to have a conversation with writers and producers that enlighten them to their own biases um, in a way that doesn't insult them, um, but allows them to expand their spectrum of possibilities. Right. <laughs> and my and my uh my job in the audition room 90% of the time was having that conversation. And sometimes it worked and when it did it, everybody was grateful for it and sometimes it was like, you know, pushing a boulder up a hill. I'm still here, you know, 30 years I've been an uh, an actor now professionally um and I've worked pretty steadily, which is more than I can say for a lot of people in this industry. So I have to be grateful for the fact that so many people were willing to take that risk and change their minds sometimes to fit me into um, a project that they didn't necessarily see me in. Um, and, that, you know, I, I, I really tip my hat, literally, to people <laughs> who took who took some risks on me, you know. Well, I think those risks have paid off. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I wanna... yeah. There was no guarantee. There was definitely no guarantee going in. That's for sure. There rarely is. There rarely is. Yes. Um, now I, I want to switch to a lighter subject. I see you're joining the Marvel Universe in uh, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Yes. Is there anything you are allowed to share about that? I can. Well, first of all, it's I'm one of like this enormous guest cast that includes like Andy Cohen and RuPaul and you know, all of these people. Um, so I play, I played the father of the main character's best friend. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and there, you know, I, I play, I play her, be her best friend's father, who's, you know, a very Puerto Rican New York dad, you know, he talks like this. It's very like this, if I remember correctly. <laughs> and that's all, right. all I can say. So it's like a teenage girl who is, secretly a superhero that's a, that i can say that much it's beautiful and it's beautifully rendered and i'm really quite proud to be a part of it i'm looking forward to it any other projects coming out that you can share with us um i can say that and i can't be specific i can say that a series that i was on that was not my so-called life is getting <laughs> a bit of a that is getting a bit of a reboot um, and we'll be on the air shortly. Okay. A little mystery, but again, yes. something to look forward to. Any new <laughs> theater projects? Are, are you still? I I wish I could say that, but you know, it's hard to commit to a theater project when I have to go back to work uh, on a new season of Discovery in the fall. So, you know, that usually when you, when you commit to a, a theater project, you have to give them more than six months you know, so this is what I got right now. <laughs> I'll well, be promoting hopefully. the heck out of out of season five. That's what I'll be doing. Well, hopefully you can uh, dip your toe back into the uh, the live stage stuff at, at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I am in dire need of that experience again. Um, anything that you'd like to say to all your fans out there? No, just that I'm really looking forward to being there in Baltimore. I can't wait for this convention. It's been a while since I've done one. So um, I was supposed to be there last year and we mixed up, we we messed up a bit because it was, it coincided with the Star Trek cruise, um, which I had already been obligated to. So I'm glad it worked out that they allowed me to come back this year. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Yeah, it's really been a pleasure talking to you. I, I, I think we've gone slightly over time. 
Um, but thank you so okay. much for spending the time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks everyone out there for watching. Um, and again, Far Point 30, it's in Hunt Valley, Maryland, right near Baltimore, February 10th to the 12th, um, 20, 2023. I go every year and I'm glad that I'm going to be seeing Wilson there and be great to see all of you guys out there, there as well. Yeah, come on out. <laughs> and as always, have fun and follow your fandom. Hi, this is Maisie richardson Sellers, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight. Be a legend and hit that like button. And most importantly, have fun and follow your fandom.